Hello everyone, I'm Sophie and I'm in Kachara Forest Retreat, Bentong, Malaysia. And I'll be continuing to share from this book, Gurus for Hire, Enlightenment for Sale, an insider's guide into the relationship between spiritual teachers, students and centres. This is by my Guru, His Eminence, the 25th, Sam Toku Rinpoche. I'll be reading from page 193, Ordination Vows. And I'll share a picture with you. Here's a picture of my Guru and all the Dharma brothers and sisters. Page 193, Ordination Vows. Why there are vows or not? In the Vinaya, the rules and regulations for monks, Buddha mentioned that women who become ordained should be on a low, lower status than men when men who become ordained. For the last 2,000 years, it was fine, but people who hear that today would say that is wrong. We now know that it is wrong. But historically, there, are, there was a reason for Buddha to say that. During his time, Buddha was introducing a whole new faith to society. He may have been a Buddha, but everybody else who was receiving the teachings was not a Buddha. And the ancient India society at that time had very strict rules for women. Women were not of equal status to men then. The women never had the freedom that the men had. A woman running around with another male who was not his relative was very bad for the man and the woman because it was considered bad manners and meant something not good. Buddha had to be very sensitive to the place, the people and the culture. He was starting a new order with monks within a society where women were second-class citizens. If he was to ordain women and put them on the same level as men, with the same monasteries and the same dwelling places, it would be very scandalous. Society would not have accepted it, and they would have stopped the movement of Buddhism. So, Buddha separated the women into nunneries. They were not allowed to live together or sit together. In ancient Indian society, men sat in front and women sat at the back. So monks also sat in front and nuns sat at the back to reflect the order of society then. This was done to help the Buddha's teachings gain adherence and acceptance. It was a cultural move of acceptance that Buddha had to implement. It was not like that anymore. Sorry, it is not like that anymore. Now monks and nuns sit equally, which is the way it should be. Buddha has compassion and all beings are the same, but he had to work with the society then. He had no choice. Buddha should have known if something was wrong or right, but he could not fight the whole society at that time if they did not have the karma to receive the truth then. In time, people would understand dharma and the wrong would become right. The major root vows of the Vinaya cannot be manipulated, moved or changed. But Buddha has said that although rules 253 vows were made for the Sangha, the 249 auxiliary minor vows could be changed in the future, according to time and place. For example, monks were not allowed to wear a cloth between their thighs, from the front of their genitalia to the back. The reason for that was to avoid stimulation. But if you have a bunch of monks running around now with nothing there, it would be very questionable. Also, the monks used to bathe in the river naked. They had very little clothes. They did not have underwear, and because it was hot, they would take off their robes to bathe. Problems arose from that, the village people would get a free show. Some of the monks were tall, dark and handsome, and that created problems. So Buddha said, you cannot go into lakes and rivers and bathe naked, but these things can change. 
these kind of rules do not apply anymore because who goes to bathe in a river naked now? Monks are not allowed to work in the fields because they might kill insects. But when Ganden monks from Tibet fled to South India, they had to work in the fields or the whole religious tradition would die. They either had to break a minor rule and confess it, or let the Dharma die because they sat in the jungle waiting for someone else to clear the forest for them. Those things can be broken, and with the right intent, if I dare so say so. I do not think the repercussion is that horrible. The minor rules are more cultural and can be changed, but it must be by a council of Sangha members. Buddha specifically advised that a council of elders must convene, talk and decide together in order for mi minor rules to be changed. The major rules, however, cannot be changed. In a tradition like Dharma, that has been around for such a long time, it cannot be just one person changing the rules, even if he is famous, well-known, big or powerful. Even if he had the power to change things, someone else could change it again when he dies. When he is alive, he might say, white, no black. When he dies, someone else might say, black, no white. And it goes back and forth. One generation says yes, another generation says no. It creates confusion on the whole samsaric level. If we want to go down that road, to say our gurus are wrong and our practice is wrong, if we want to set a precedent where eminent people can change things just like that, we will start a trend. Other eminent people will arise and change things again and again and again. Disrobement, what it means. When a monk takes ordination, he has four root vows that cannot be broken and another 249 auxiliary auxiliary vows that he must hold. These vows are on the basis of the refuge vows, which he would have already taken. A monk can be a Mahayana monk or a Hinayana monk, but both the vows are exactly the same. It is the motivation that makes it different. The vows of a monk are called Praktish Moksha vow. Moksha is a Sanskrit word, meaning the end of suffering, nirvana. Prati means self. Prakti moksha means self-liberating vows. Lama Tsongkhapa's Guru Yoga mentions three sets of vows. The first set is prakti moksha, the second is bodhisattva, and the third is tantrayana, tantric vows. For lay people, prakti moksha vows are likened to refuge vows. The three sets of vows can also be refuge, bodhisattva and tantric. For a monk to disrobe, he has to be in front of at least four people who are sound in mind and knowledge, who are alert and awake, and who understand the significance of what is going on. He has to pronounce three times to them, I give up my vows and think that he has no more vows then he has no more vows. Or he can go to his guru and offer the vows back in the same manner. The second way is, if any of the four root vows are broken, for example, stealing with intent and completion of the act, killing with intention and completion of the act, etc. If any of the four root vows is broken with the four factors of intention, he wants it, he does it, the act is completed and he is happy. Then, although only one was broken, all is lost and he is disrobed. The four transgressions which would cause a monk to be disrobed are lying, killing, stealing and sexual misconduct. An example of lying is talking about attainments that you do not have and the person you lie to believes in you. For killing, there must be intent. The object must be a human, the action is completed, the, act, the person actually dies and will rejoice. 
If a monk kills someone by accident, for example, he accidentally runs him over and the person dies, then he is not disrobed. He has the karma of killing that person, of course, but and he has to purify that karma, but he is not disrobed. If a monk steals, he takes an object, he keeps it, and has the feeling that it is his, whether the other person knows it or not, he is disrobed. The last is sexual intercourse in any of the orifices, which means the monk's genitalia is inserted in the orifice. He performs the action and completes it inside the orifice. Then the monk is disrobed. During Buddha's time, there was a nun who attended Buddha's teachings. When she attended the teachings, the monks made a lot of noise and told her she could not sit with the Sangha. She was told she must sit with the lay people because she has broken her vows. When asked why, it was revealed that she was raped by bandits while meditating in her cave. The Buddha asked her, Did you invite that? She said no. When they were doing the act, did you rejoice? She said no. And when they finished, were you happy? Did you think this was a good experience? She said no. Then Buddha said, You are not disrobed. Please sit with the Sangha. Even though she was in full intercourse, she was not disrobed because the intent was not there. Some of the petty monks who did not know better accused her of being disrobed simply because she was raped and was in full sexual intercourse. But the Buddha said no, intent is very important. If any of the 249 auxiliary vows were, are broken, a monk is not disrobed. He can repair infractions of those during monk confessionals held once a month where the Sangha confess any minor infractions to the abbot. Any of the minor infractions that are broken, such as eating afternoon, not meditating, wearing underwear, having hair longer than two finger span, can be repaired. Those do not constitute breaking your vows because those depend on the situation or circumstances. In extreme cases, in certain environmental conditions, Monks may have to wear lay clothes, grow their hair long, or carry weapons. If it is for a purpose, then it is an infringe, infringement of the vows but not a broken vow. It does not mean he is disrobed. For example, when His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama escaped from Tibet, he wore a lay person's outfit with a sling and a rifle, because if he wore his robes, they would have found him and captured him. Did he break his monk vows? No. There was a reason for him doing that. In some places, it is not appropriate to wear monk robes because if they do, they will be scorned or there will be danger or difficulty in entering the place. They do not wear or reside in monk robes for the sake of being able to disseminate the Dharma. A monk who is not wearing monk robes or who has his hair longer than two fingers with is not breaking his vows. This does not merit being disrobed, giving and taking back robes. If a monk or nuns break any of the four root vows, he or she can never take robes in this life again. They are disrobed. A good thing for a monk or a nun to do is to go back and offer the remaining vows that are not broken to their guru. That is very important. He may have broken one vow and become disrobed, but he still has three other vows, and he would not want to break those also. It is better to repair the vows and give them back intact. That means that even if a monk killed someone out of anger, I have not heard this happen. He, had, he has not stolen, lied, or committed sexual misconduct. Once he becomes a lay person, there might be a danger that he would steal or lie, so he would break the remaining vows. He is not a monk anymore, but the vows are still there, and he has to return those vows so that he does not commit, an, sorry, does not commit more, more error. When monks or nuns declare 
they are giving their vows back in front of four people or more, or to the abbot, they may take the ropes again when they are ready. They can give back and take their ropes seven times in one lifetime. For example, a monk at the monastery may find out that his parents are dying and suffering very much. He may need to go back to his family's hometown to work and support his parents for a few years. He can give his ropes and vows back and go to work as a lay person, since he cannot work as a monk, to support his family. After he has taken care of his family, he can go back to the abbot and retake his vows again. I've seen holy monks give their vows back because they were in other countries and had to work to support themselves and take their vows back later. My holy Mahasiddha master, Geshe Sotrim Gelson, did that. He gave his vows back properly in the 1980s because he had to support himself and had to work. About 10 years later, he went to His Holiness and received his vows back again. It is allowed as long as the vows are given back intact. There are monks in prison in Tibet who were not allowed to wear their robes or cut their hair for 20 or 30 years. The minute they got out of prison, they put their robes back on. Does this mean they, were, they are disrobed? Absolutely not. A monk in a, is a state of his mind, not what he wears. There are other minor rules like monks not being allowed to wear sleeves or having to cover the left side of their body. But what are the monks supposed to do if they are travelling to freezing cold places? His Holiness Kapje Zong Rinpoche wore sleeves when he travelled in America because it was very cold. Then his Zen would be folded and put on top. The sixth Dalai Lama, Sangyang Gyatso, gave his vows back. He was a lay person. He had consorts and he hung around in Lhasa. It was no problem at all. The previous Panchen Lama was a lay person for the last 30 to 40 years of his life and wore yellow chubas, traditional Tibetan clothes, all the time. The communists forced him to take a wife, so he took a wife to make them happy. It did not affect his attainments and his incarnation came back. In the Tibetan tradition, no lay person can disrobe a monk or a nun. No lay person can touch or pull their ropes off and say they are disrobed. The lay person does not have the authority to say anything to a monk. Lay people do not understand the monk vows or never studied the monk vows will say. He's disrobed and now he's robed again. When they talk like that, they reveal their ignorance and lack of knowledge. It is lay people pointing fingers at the Sangha and not knowing the consequences. It is very derogatory and very dangerous because they spread very, very unhealthy rumours which has repercussions. And that is the end of my session. And thank you very much for sharing your time with me. And with this chapter, as Rinpoche said, uh, as Rinpoche was teaching about uh, monks and their vows. And um, I do hope that you join me for my next session as I continue on with the book. And I'll end this session with a completion dedication in Tibetan. Yang jo sen chorin po shi ma ke panam ke yu shi ke panam pa me pa yang gone gone do pe wa shu. To ni to wa rin po shi ma ke panam ke yu shi ke panam pa me pa yang gone gone do pe wa shu. Da so ji ni sa pa ge wa di tan tan tro wa gona ka pa da che pa che su no san tra pa yi tan ping in po rin du sa se shu. Ke wa kun tu yan da la ma da tra mi cho ki pa la long cho che in sa dam nang yi yot ne ra zo ni do je chang yi ngo pa ngo tu su. Ge wa di yin yu du da la ma sang yu du yu ne dre wa chi kya ma lu pa de yi sa la go pa shu. Cho ki kya po song ka pa cho su na pa pe wa la ke ki sa ma si wa da ng tun ki ma lu sang wa shu. 
ดาดัมสิงยูดุสันดาดรัวดรัวซองยีลาตินีเกวาลอสันตรัปปายตัมปายูริวาเกวชินิโมเดลเลสันเดลเลนิมีกุญญันเดลเลชินนิสินตัต